This is part three of five on chapter four, general features of cells. In the last section, or part of this chapter, you looked at prokaryotic cells. In this section, we're gonna start to look at the eukaryotic cells. So these eukaryotic cells, we're gonna have animal and plant cells that we're gonna be looking at. And we're gonna look through all the parts of it. So eukaryotic cells, their DNA is housed inside of the nucleus, so they have a membrane-bound nucleus. Eukaryotic cells also exhibit compartmentalization. This means that they have structures called organelles. And these organelles, they're membrane-bound compartments, and they have their own structure and they have their own function. So just like the prokaryotic cell section, we're gonna be focusing on the structure and function of these different parts in our eukaryotic cells. Here is a drawing of an animal cell up here. So you can see there's a lot more going on inside of the cell. There's lots of different parts. Um, you have the nucleus in the middle, and inside the nucleus you have your chromatin or your DNA, and you have other structures. Um, outside of that nucleus, you have things like the Golgi apparatus, the endoplasmic reticulum, um, we'll have mitochondria, centrosomes, so there's a lot going on. We're also going to be looking at plant cells as well, which are another type of eukaryotic cell. So you can still see the nucleus in the middle, it's that purple larger circle in the middle, it has the red chromatin in it. Um, you see Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, and then if you look around the outside, there are three structures that are outlined in green. Those are organelles that are only found in plant cells. So it's really important, even though animal and plant cells are very similar, they still have a few differences outlined on this slide. Eukaryotic cells are very, very diverse. Um, they tend to differentiate very easily. So for example, on the left hand, we have human skin cells. And we're gonna be looking at those in lab if you haven't already looked at them. On the right, we have a nerve cell. In the nerve cell, you can see there's lots of projections coming out of it. So they're both eukaryotic cells, but you can definitely see that they look a lot different and they have different functions. We're going to start off by looking at um, parts of a cell, specifically the cytosol. We're going to start with that. So I have the animal cell up here and in the red box I have the cytosol. So that highlights what part of the cell I'm going to be looking at. So the cytosol it's the region outside the organelles, but it's inside the plasma membrane. So basically the cytosol is kind of this liquid gelatin substance. It has solutes dissolved in it, it has enzymes, it has ribosomes, and it's gonna help with some of the metabolism of the cell, so some of those chemical reactions. So the cytosol, like I just mentioned, it's that central coordinating region for many metabolic activities of your eukaryotic cell. And a lot of these metabolic activities are not simple reactions, like you don't start off with reactants and products right away. You usually have long metabolic pathways. So you have a series of reactions, and all these reactions, they're accelerated or they're sped up by enzymes. So here we have those enzymes again. Remember, enzymes, they're a type of protein. And metabolism, we'll really get into that in the next unit. We're gonna be looking at photosynthesis and cellular respiration for the main two metabolic pathways. Some metabolic pathways in the cytosol are catabolism pathways. This is where you break down a molecule into smaller components. So sometimes a cell wants to break things down. For food, for example, it's a good one. Other times a cell wants to synthesize the four different types of macromolecules, and that's anabolism. 
So anytime we put together carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, that's the anabolism metabolic pathway. Besides being the central coordinating system for metabolism, the cytosol also contains the cytoskeleton. And it's kind of just like it sounds, it's a skeleton inside of the cell. Kind of like we have a skeleton in our bodies. So this cytoskeleton is made up of a network of three different types of protein filaments. So these are proteins, they're just long proteins. And we have microtubules, which are, you know, fairly standard size. Intermediate filaments, which are intermediate in size. And then actin filaments, which are tiny little filaments. In your book, Table 4.1, looks at these different types of filaments you find in the cytoskeleton. On the very right you have the microtubules. These are the larger filaments. They are mostly used for um, cell shape and to organize all of the organelles inside of the cell. In the middle you have intermediate filaments. They're intermediate in size, hence the name. Intermediate filaments, they're also there to help provide cell shape, and then they can um, anchor the cell and nuclear membranes to each other. Then the smallest filament is the actin filament. And these are very, very tiny, short little proteins. They also function to help give the cell shape, just like the other two filaments. Um, they help in muscle contractions, and they also help to move things around inside of your cell. Included in with the cytoskeleton, so those three different types of filaments we just looked at, there's another type of protein called motor proteins. These are a type of cellular protein that use ATP, which is an energy storage molecule. They use that ATP as a source of energy to promote movement. And this could be cell movement, or it could be like tissue movement, so moving muscles around. There are three different types of movement that motor proteins can do. So the first type is that motor proteins can move cargo from one location to another. So down in this picture we have a microtubule. It's made out of the green and blue amino acids. You have your little motor protein. It looks like it has two little legs and it's holding up a cargo. This motor protein, it looks like it walks along the microtubule and then as it walks along it uses ATP, so it uses energy, to pull that cargo from one spot to the other. The second type of movement is when you have a motor protein that remains in place and it actually moves a filament. So here we have more of a hinge-like protein. So this motor protein, it grabs onto the filament and then it pulls the filament. So here, that red actin filament is being pulled to the left by the motor proteins. The third type of movement is when you have a motor protein that attempts to walk, but the motor protein and the filament are restricted in their movement. This causes a force to develop, and it causes the filament to actually bend to one side or to the other, depending on what motor protein is attempting to walk in this one. Besides the cytosol and the cytoskeleton that we just looked at, eukaryotic cells can also have appendages. So they can have flagella. Those are the longer structures. They usually only have one or two flagella per cell. Eukaryotic cells can also have cilia. These are the shorter hair-like structures that cover a part or the entire surface of a cell. So if we look at the pictures here, on the left you have a sperm cell that has one flagella, and that flagella whips back and forth. 
In the middle, we have a species of algae that has two flagella, so it has a pair of flagella coming out the top. That allows that algae to move through the environment. And then on the right, you have a paramecium that are covered with lots and lots of cilia. So it's that shorter hair-like structure on this cell right here. So this part kind of covered a few of the main parts of the cell. So we have the cytosol responsible for metabolism. We have the cytoskeleton that helps with cell shape, helps to hold organelles in place, it helps to transport cargo around. And then we also have these appendages that the eukaryotic cell may or may not have.